Sorry, I'm not sure if I was supposed to line up a piano player. Yeah, but... nobody tells me anything. Okay. <laughs> would, would you mind playing for us? Well, good evening and welcome to our midweek service. Uh, we're going to start out, there I am. Good evening and welcome. Um, we're going to start out with uh, a missions hymn. We have kind of a missions theme for our equip class tonight and next week, the Lord willing. Uh, for, the sake of, for the sake of his name is a song we've sung before. Uh, I think you're familiar with it. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and stand and we'll sing, Go to the world for the sake of his name, to every nation his glory proclaim. Go to the world for the sake of his name, to every nation his glory proclaim. Pray that the spirit wise will open darkened eyes, granting you life to display Jesus' fame. In Jesus' power, preach Christ to the lost. For Jesus' glory, count all else but lost. Gather from every place trophies of sovereign grace. Lest life be wasted, exalt Jesus' cross. Love the unloved for the sake of his name. Like Christ befriend those whose heads hang in shame. Jesus did not condemn, but was condemned for them. Trust gospel power, for we once were the same. In Jesus' power, preach Christ to the lost, for Jesus' glory. But lost, gather from every place trophies of sovereign grace. Last life be wasted, exalt Jesus' cross. Rescue the lost for the sake of his name. As Christ commands, snatch them out of the flame. Tell that when Jesus died, God's wrath was satisfied. Urge them to flee to the Lamb who was slain. In Jesus' power, preach Christ to the lost. For Jesus' glory, count all else but lost. Gather from every place. Trophies of sovereign grace, last night be wasted, exalt Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I'll share just a few highlights from the prayer bulletin before we uh, begin with our presentation tonight. Um, if you have the prayer bulletin in front of you, the current health and other needs, uh, the beginning of our list is always the most uh, recent updates and uh, some of the most urgent needs. Um, so I trust you'll take a look at those. Remember to pray for those, those folks this week. Uh, then we, of course, have our recovery needs and ongoing illnesses, those who've been on our prayer, prayer list for, for some time. Um, and I always encourage you, I was going to say this before I looked at it, uh, to look at the back of the parables, and it has our people of the week. And the reason why I chuckle is because uh, I happen to be on there. And it's not why I'm asking you to look at the back. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, I do need, uh, do need all the prayer I can get. So I don't mind pointing to there. So uh, it's always um, 
I know it's encouraging to those uh, in our church that we pray for, our deacons, our ICA staff, uh, and then, of course, our government leader and missionary and shut-in of the week. Uh, whenever we can remember to pray for those people faithfully and even reach out to them as, have, as we have an opportunity, it's just a nice point uh, for connection to let them know, hey, we're praying for you because you're our such and such, and such of the week. So I encourage you to, remember, to take this with you and remember these uh, requests throughout the week. I don't want to skip over the announcements, though. I don't want to get in trouble with Pastor. Uh, so at the very beginning, uh, we have the Ladies' Precept Bible Study, which is beginning tomorrow. So if you've signed up for that, uh, I know my wife is looking forward to that. It begins tomorrow, August 18th. And then uh, Awana begins this coming Sunday. And several of us were able to pass out door hangers yesterday. And I was, um, I was convicted by... Um, um, Sister Jackie Black, who was talking about, oh, we need to be faithful to pray that uh, we see fruit from what we did last night. And that was a good reminder and a rebuke to me. That I don't always think to, sometimes we go and we do the work, but we forget to do the, uh, the work in prayer, following up, that the Lord would, would bring fruit from those labors. Uh, so that begins uh, on, on Sunday. So I know Brother uh, Matt and, and Ben would appreciate our prayer for the Awana program. And then this coming Saturday is a work day at ICA. Starting at 8 a.m., we're going to be putting together teachers' desks, uh, including my own. So I'm um, looking forward to that and uh, hoping I don't mess mine up too much and it collapses on me during class or something. But we'll have a work day from 8 a.m. until about 12.30, and then lunch will be provided from 12.30 to 1.00. So if you can come out for that, that would be appreciated. As we get started tonight, it's a little bit different. Um, Pastor has allowed me uh, to show a film uh, for this week and next Wednesday, which are my uh, two Wednesdays to, uh, to get to do the equip class. And I appreciate his letting me do this. Uh, we are going to take a look at one of the dispatches from the front. I don't know how many of you own or have seen any of the dispatches films. Our missionary, uh, John Hutchison, with Frontline Missions, came through about a year and a half ago, maybe. And he um, had some of these for sale at the time. And uh, my wife and I love these. We used to, to check these out uh, from the library at Bob Jones and, and, and watch these films. They're, they're missions documentaries, if you haven't seen any of them. And basically, the director of this missions organization, Frontline Missions, he goes and visits his, their missionaries and other foreign nationals, or nationals there in those countries that they have contact with. And he does a documentary, missions documentary, of what the work of the church is like in that particular country. country. And he is narrating his journals that he has logged during his trip. Uh, so it's his firsthand account. He's the, the voice, and you also see him in the video. Uh, and this, the one that I chose is I thought about and prayed about which film we should watch. There are something like 16, 18 different films that they've produced by now in different countries around Asia and, and the Middle East and uh, Africa in particular. Uh, I thought as I prayed about it that it would be good to, to do the one on China. And a couple of reasons that I think about that is, uh, first of all, China has the largest population in the world, uh, nearly a billion and a half people, nearly one million five one billion five hundred million people compared to about 325 million in the United States and the Lord has been doing a work there when we think of China we often think of um, communism we think of cybersecurity issues we think of the conflict uh, in the news between uh, Chinese interests and American interests and we have a lot of thoughts that come to our mind but and I don't think our first thought is uh, the opportunity for the gospel in that in that nation uh, the the, the um, director of the film here, the narrator of the film, will talk about a little bit in the beginning the history of missions in China. And it's pretty fascinating. He'll talk about Hudson Taylor and, and some other folks. He'll, he'll start in England, actually, and then we'll go over to China. And one of the ma amazing things is since the missions movement really took took root in China in the mid-1800s, over the past 150, 170 years now, uh, the church has grown. Even under communism, the church has flourished there, uh, so much so that I think he mentions the estimate is maybe 100 million Christians in China. Uh, so we're talking about many more Christians in China than even in the United States. That's in a communist country. Uh, that's how powerful our gospel is, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and how powerful our, our God is to raise up uh, millions of believers in, under a communist regime. And we'll see more of that in the film, and more of how the Lord is, is working there. And one of my prayers for us as a church is that seeing this film would challenge us uh, to have a global vision of the gospel. Uh, I want to share with you a passage that undoubtedly uh, you all know. Uh, the Great Commission pastor preaches it often. 
uh, from the end of Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And we know that, that line well. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And we'll watch about half the film today, and then we'll pause uh, for the last 15 minutes or so to have some discussion, some application. That's what you have the hand handout for in front of you. And I want us to, to think about as we watch this and as we get into the discussion later on, uh, how, does the, how should the gospel, how should the Great Commission play out in my life? Right here in Anderson, Indiana, as Pastor challenges on Sunday night, uh, a lot of times we have, uh, when we think about missions, we think about the Great Commission, we think about something that happens out there, something that someone else does, but it starts here. It starts right here in Anderson. And how can we improve uh, or get, get involved in the Great Commission work where we are? And then how can we get a vision for what God's doing in other parts of the world? So that's my thought and my prayer behind what we're doing. I'll ask uh, Brother David to go ahead and start the film. And uh, like I said, toward uh, the uh, last 15 minutes or so, I'll get back up here and we'll, we'll talk about some applications for our personal life. Thank you, David. This is a story about China. Not the China of the headlines. Not about super cities or superpowers. But this story is about something much bigger. For China's ascendance on the world stage coincides with its rise as a gospel force. The number of Chinese Christians may now be approaching 100 million, and a truly Chinese church movement is underway, reaching the teeming coastal cities spreading like wildfire across the central grasslands and pushing westward to the walls of the Himalayas and beyond. From the starting point of the modern missions movement in the West 200 years ago, China's size and distance was magnetic, at least for men and women with a big enough view of the gospel to go. China was to missionaries what Everest was to mountain climbers. Before reaching Guangzhou in 1807, pioneer missionary Robert Morrison struggled between taking the gospel to China or Timbuktu and prayed that God would station him in that part of the missionary field where the difficulties were greatest and to all human appearances, the most insurmountable. Morrison chose China. Around the same time, William Carey wrote, to know the will of God, we need an open Bible and an open map. There was a reckless abandon about Christians who started at the back pages of an atlas to find God's will. But then, cross-bearing Christ followers are all about reckless abandon. The laughter of seagulls echoes over a picture postcard morning as sailboats play in the silver sea. The remnants of an old pier make a fine front row seat for painting this canvas with my pen. 
but the beach at Brighton is much, much more than just a pretty place. Life and death decisions were made here. It was a beachhead of faith and gospel vision that launched Kingdom Advance on the other side of the world. I arrived in London yesterday and walked to Westminster in the heart of one of my favorite cities in the world. But after a sleepless Atlantic crossing, it took more than Big Ben to keep me awake. Found a good cappuccino in a shop just across from Parliament and escaped the crush of Saturday tourists to find a quiet place by the Thames. I want to start the China story in England because to see the past in the present is a beautiful reminder that our God is at work at all times and in all places. Although there are many gospel paths that can be traced back here, for London was the Antioch of the 19th century, I'm on the trail of the trailblazer Hudson Taylor. Taylor, who first went to China when he was 21, had a big view of God and the gospel that was matched with the length and depth of the spiritual needs of China's unreached millions. Taylor's simple faith in action would open the way for thousands of gospel foot soldiers in the kingdom's advance in China. But that would come only after much sacrifice and a point of surrender by the sea at Brighton. Set out from London's Victoria Station this morning, where 150 years ago, Hudson and his wife Maria also embarked on their weekend getaway to Brighton. It's fun to track the path of this missionary hero who has meant so much in my life and rolling through the Sunday morning countryside with green meadows properly appointed with cottages and sheep. I feel like I'm on a movie set of Masterpiece Theater. By the time of Brighton, Taylor had already survived six years of hard ministry in China. The gospel work during that time had been confined at least officially, to certain coastal cities. But Taylor couldn't resist going to the inland regions of China, to people who had never once heard the gospel. He and his family had returned to England to recover their health and work on a Chinese dialect translation of the New Testament. Taylor's burden for the lost in China was acute. For Taylor, who wrote and preached and prayed about a million a month there, dying without Christ. These were not statistics, they were souls. However, if others joined him in penetrating the interior with the gospel, they could expect life to be hard and short. So caught between the cries of hellbound sinners and the cries of his critics for leading others to certain death, Hudson Taylor came to Brighton. Sunday morning he went to church, but soon walked out. Later he wrote, unable to bear the sight of a congregation of a thousand or more Christian people rejoicing in their own security while millions were perishing for lack of knowledge. I wandered out on the sands alone in great spiritual agony. And there, the Lord conquered my unbelief and I surrendered myself to God for this service. Peace at once flowed into my burdened heart. There and then, I asked him for 24 fellow workers, two for each of the 11 inland provinces, which were without a missionary, and two for Mongolia. Wasting no time, as soon as he returned to London, 
Hudson Taylor formed an organization called China Inland Mission with resources the equivalent of five loaves and two small fish. His approach would eventually change the face of missions, but at the time, it was radical and ridiculed. His conviction that an agency could draw workers together in common cause from different denominations and raise financial support from God's people through prayer alone was considered naive at best and his belief that single women could also serve Christ on the foreign field was considered by some dangerous, or worse, scandalous. The qualifications of faith, prayer, and sacrificial love for Christ and the Chinese people were the credentials he most looked for in candidates. One of the men Taylor accepted in that first group of missionaries was an amputee having lost a leg in an accident as a teenager. When George Stott was asked why he thought he should go to China, given the fact he had only one leg, he answered, I do not see those with two legs going, so I must. The concerns that weighed heavily on Taylor over the dangers that missionaries would face in the interior were not idle ones. He buried his own beloved Maria just five years later as well as three of their children. During uprisings and persecution over the years, including the Boxer Rebellion, hundreds of missionaries and thousands of Chinese Christians would be martyred. Still they came, by the hundreds, rank after rank, to the front lines of gospel advance in China. As Samuel Zwimmer once wrote, they had this passion to call that country their home, which was most in need of the gospel. In this passion, all other passions died. Before this vision, all other visions faded. This call drowned all other voices. They were the pioneers of the kingdom, the trailblazers of God. When Hudson Taylor first journeyed to Shanghai, it took nearly six months by sea. Today, my Boeing 777 is seven miles high, making 600 miles per hour through the stratosphere, and will close the gap between London and Shanghai in just 12 hours. Taylor's wooden ship smashed into several storms and barely skirted past an island of cannibals. But what did he have to complain about? He never had to sit in economy class for the better part of a day, endure the same old selection of in-flight movies, and drink substandard coffee. Those early missionaries had no idea how easy they had it. Those were the good old days. Reached Shanghai late afternoon and took the Maglev, the first of its kind train, powered not by engines on wheels, but by magnetic levitation. This showcase connection between Pudong Airport and China's largest city is like a rocket on a rail, smooth and fast, delivering me downtown in seven minutes. By nightfall, found my hotel, a high rise overlooking the Huangpu River and a Shanghai skyline veiled in rain. It has been a long day of crowds and constant motion. It's good to hit the brakes and breathe and soon sleep. Tomorrow I set out to find my friends in this great city.
This morning crossed an old iron bridge, which dates back to Hudson Taylor's time. Doubtless he often crossed this canal here during his time in Shanghai. Although perhaps the only thing he would recognize now is the bend in the wide meandering Huangpu. This river was his gateway to China. Back then, Westerners, missionaries, mariners, and merchants alike all stayed in this part of Shanghai. The embankment called the Bund and its wide promenade mark what was once the wall of the foreigner's settlement. It's still a magnet for foreigners, or at least tourists, and therefore a good place to connect with my friends in order to get lost in the crowd as we quietly lay our plans for the days ahead in a country where sometimes the walls have ears. Met Mei Li along the Bund. She is what we would call an organizer in the underground church. Mei Li is a visionary, an entrepreneur, whose business is to be about our father's business. We have served together for at least a decade in the kingdom's advance in China, and she is one of the bravest women I know. Mei Li's name means beautiful, which is fitting, for she has a beautiful spirit. Her face shines with joy, and her life is adorned with the grace of the gospel. While we talked, I noticed a woman and apparently her son were throwing live fish into the river. Why? Meili explained this Buddhist ritual. Buddhists will spend large sums of money at the fish market to rescue fish caught that morning and then return them to the river. While I'm sure the fish are happy about this arrangement, it's not really about them. The amount spent and the fish being offered back into the circle of life is like money in the bank of heaven. Righteous karma credit, which will help this woman when she dies move up the ladder when she is reincarnated and perhaps be a rich woman, better yet a rich man, or at least next time around, not be moved back down a rung or two and be just another carp like the grateful ones who are getting a second chance this morning. Mei Li has seen such dark superstition many times and her eyes glistened with sorrow to tell of it. We walked on to Starbucks to find another friend who will join us for the journey ahead. Mark was a student of mine years ago during my history professor days. I remember telling him before he graduated, quoting the classic frontier line, go west, young man, go west. Mark really took my advice because he went so far west, he ended up in the east. He and his wife and family have been serving Christ here for several years, and he's taken time off from his company to travel. Mark's love for the gospel, his love for the Chinese, and his skill in their language make him the perfect companion for our journey. He's a dear friend, the best of men. Since all three of us are Tolkien fans, we jokingly call ourselves the Fellowship of the Ring. The first quest on our long journey was for dumplings. I had to have some of the famous Shanghai Jiaozi. But before we found them, the low, heavy sky that had been threatening all morning finally gave way. We bought some umbrellas from a street vendor and sloshed on through the downpour. After a few twists and turns, we found the diner where locals say the best Jiaozi is served. I believe them. Stacks of bamboo baskets held steaming goodness. When bathed in a bit of soy and vinegar, they are amazing. My chopstick skills, though, are clumsy at best. 
Right. For May Lee, chopsticks are effortless and artful. For me, they're good mostly for poking things. I asked May Lee if my table manners were worse than a baby's. She, an honest woman, said, yes. Late afternoon, May Lee arranged for us to meet an old uncle, that is, an elderly leader in the house church movement. Uncle Zhao has known Mei Li for years, and since Zhao trusts her, he was willing to meet Mark and me and share his stories and counsel. There are few such men left. Thousands of pastors were executed by the communists in the 1950s and 60s, and many thousands more died in prison starved to death, worked to death, or beaten to death. Mr. Zhao went to prison back when he was in college. 2,000 other preachers in his province were also rounded up. Only 200 of them made it out alive. Uncle Zhao is now in his 70s, but still going strong. He's an itinerant evangelist and teacher. We know him as Zhao, but he goes by other names in other places to help cover his tracks from the police and their informants. His life is given, doubtless to the last of it, to the advance of the gospel and the health of the church. He said the Lord did something special in the 1950s in building a truly Chinese church, one birthed in suffering and multiplied in persecution, but one that, like any church, can still lose its focus. Uncle Zhao voiced concern about the detriment and divisions brought on by Western Christianity's money and methods. When asked once to give his thoughts about the purpose-driven church, he answered simply with the purpose that continues to drive him. Follow Christ. Lift up the cross. We urged Uncle Chow to stay on and have supper with us, but he couldn't. He had a train to catch and believers to teach in other cities, Christians who know him by face, if not by name. Uncle must keep moving. Through the mist and a rain-spattered window, the gaudy lights of Shanghai run like watercolors. Boat lights blink in the river, and the skyline, like me, seems to be shutting down for the night. Tomorrow we set out for Beijing and beyond, like old Uncle Zhao. We've got to keep moving. Took the bullet train to Beijing. Our train slips through miles of mist, smooth, effortless. This rail is a real silk road. And traveling at 190 miles per hour, I feel like Superman without the cape. This fast ride is a mirror of China's rapid rise. Long stretches of apartments and factories were, not long ago, squatty little villages where farmers' fields stood and water buffaloes plowed. The land is now laced with asphalt and choked with truck traffic. It's as if everyone, all of a sudden, just decided to skip a century. China has changed and the world is changing with her. 
adjusting to new realities in Asia and beyond. But it's too early to think too much about geopolitics. And so I went in search of coffee. As I walked through the crowded cars, I thought of something the traveler Paul Thoreau wrote from one of his many train trips. Travel means living among strangers, their characteristic stinks and sour perfumes. eating their food, listening to their dramas. Being always on the move towards an uncertain destination, creating an itinerary, inventing the trip, cobbling together a set of habits in order to stay sane, keeping out of trouble. and writing everything down in order to remember. With five hours before reaching the capital, it's a good time to hear more of Mei Li's story. Mei Li's life mirrors China's pace of change. When she was growing up, there were no grocery stores, no clothing shops. The government issued coupons for most everything, at least while the supplies lasted. Except for the party elites, it was a communist utopia of scarcity, control, and fear. It was what Winston Churchill called an equality of misery. Mei Li's dad worked long hours, seven days a week, so she didn't see much of him. She adored her mother and was fiercely protective of her younger sister. She learned to mask her fear with a strong face, protect the weak, meet trouble head on, even if her feet wanted to run the other way. I asked Mei Li to write in my journal the Chinese character for bravery. I expected a single character, a few ink strokes of Mandarin. Instead, what she did revealed so much about her heart. She penned three of her favorite quotations. If I had a thousand lives to give, I would give them all for China. No, for Christ, Hudson Taylor. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose, Jim Elliot. And one by William Borden, who turned his back on fame and fortune to take the gospel to China, but died before he reached these shores. He had written in his Bible, no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. I'd ask her to write the character for bravery. Instead, she wrote of brave character. With tears in her eyes, Mei Li said that these gospel trailblazers modeled Christ-like courage for her and other Chinese believers. The fearful little girl who put on her game face and met trouble head on hasn't changed that much. Only now, she isn't taking the lead. Christ is. And she's just following him. No regrets. No retreat.
set out yesterday to explore a bit of Beijing. The Chinese capital has over 22 million inhabitants, greater in population than most countries in the world, and a population density that's comparable to a crowded elevator. We started out at the Temple of Heaven, a complex built 600 years ago by the Ming emperors who sought to restore the earliest, the most ancient beliefs of China. Herein is a mystery. There's something here that smacks of original revelation, like what the generation after Noah would have known. There are no idols here. It was a place of prayer and sacrifice to the God of heaven by the emperor who was the mediator between God and his people. Somewhere beyond the marble dragons and lines of tourists, there's a hint of something true here, that centuries of darkness and spirit worship have veiled it. In one of the temple's open doors, I crowded in to see the carved vaults. Hands were extended in prayer and picture taking. A shaman was there, calling on the spirits to fill him, doubtless hoping it would enhance his resume back home as a fortune teller. As his empty chant echoed in the emptiness, I thought of the passage in Romans. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Lord Jesus, God of heaven, who died that sinners like me and this man might live, have mercy on him. Break his chains. Give him eyes to see you, that he too might live. In the afternoon, went to Tiananmen Square, a vast China-sized plaza flanked with the monuments and muscle of the Communist Party. At one end is Mao's mausoleum, where the corpse of the modern China's godlike founder is on display in a glass case. Communists have this weird thing about pickling their supreme leaders in formaldehyde and painting them up like a mannequin. And then every few years when they start to rot, do it all over again. It's creepy. Lenin, Mao, Ho Chi Minh, and those crazy leaders in North Korea are all on permanent display for their faithful followers to reverence. It's atheism's pathetic version of the resurrection. I'm thankful my supreme leader's tomb is empty. History has been written as well as erased and rewritten here. In Tiananmen Square in 1949, Mao announced the communists' victory and the founding of the People's Republic of China. A massive portrait now hangs where he stood. Mao became the biggest mass murderer of the 20th century, responsible for at least 60 million deaths more than double that of Hitler and Stalin combined. Mao's greatest weapon was fear, for boundless terror is the best way to control hundreds of millions of people from cradle to grave. Mei Li was a little girl when Mao died, but fear, like his corpse, remained long afterwards. When Mei Li was a teenager, a peaceful student demonstration burgeoned into a freedom movement right here in Tiananmen Square. 
the world was stunned by the courage of these students and their rulers were threatened by it. So with a word, the army moved in, killing untold thousands of them. The square ran with blood. But all that has been cleaned up now. Inside China, history books have been cleaned up too. And internet searches for Tiananmen Square Massacre show no results. Beyond all the Instagram moments and souvenir sellers, this place is filled with paranoia. The Communist Party is looking over its shoulder here and the people know they are being watched. Afterwards, took a taxi out to a showcase church near Beijing's Olympic Village, a government that can tell its people what they can eat and wear will also hear the term the underground church, um, I wouldn't think so much of a church's meeting underground in a place of hiding, although in some areas it is like that. Uh, but um, actually, Hannah has two cousins who are essentially missionaries in, in China. Uh, but as you know, it's, it's one of those countries that we call creative access nations where uh, you can't show up there and say, hi, I'm an American and I'm a Christian and I want to be a missionary to evangelize your people. But you can show up there as an American business person, as an engineer, as a doctor, as a nurse, uh, as an English teacher, and you can live your life as a Christian. Uh, and there are some risks. Uh, he mentioned in the film that it seems like uh, the walls have ears at times in China, and that's not far from uh, how it really is there. The government is sur surveilling just about everything. And, um, but as far as the church goes, there is a limited amount, amount of freedom. I uh, like like we heard, there are some 100, 100 million Christians in China, so it's not like the government doesn't know about them. Uh, one thing that we've learned from our personal uh, contacts in China is that typically Americans or any foreigners who there as Christians uh, don't want to, to congregate with other uh, Christian, uh, Chinese Christians because that draws attention to those Chinese Christians, that, that draws attention to their gathering. So typically, foreigners, foreign Christians American Christians, for example, will gather with other American Christians and that kind of a thing, and the Chinese will gather uh, with, uh, together themselves. And before we run out of time this evening, uh, I would direct your attention to the handout in Lesson 1. It says, Open Bible, Open Map. William, William Carey's observation that in order to know the will of God, we need an open Bible and an open map. It sounds very familiar to Jesus' charge to his disciples in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And uh, this is in another version here, but uh, we know it as, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He goes on to say, uh, What other biblical texts reinforce Carrie's idea? Numerous, for example, numerous geographic references in the book of Acts. Question here, Do you find yourself emphasizing one component of Christ's charge, the Great Commission, uh, for example, going versus teaching, more highly or more often than the other? How does missing one of the components impact the advance of the gospel? If we were in a smaller room and had more time, I would open it up for discussion. But just to get you thinking, one, one application I thought from my own life here is um, I'm pretty motivated to go in, and to meet people here in, in Anderson, people in my neighborhood. I love connecting with people. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's intimidating. Uh, but I, I enjoy meeting people. But for me, the harder part is the, the teaching part. Now, when we, when we see that word teaching in Matthew, we don't think so much, you know, getting up and doing what I'm doing tonight or what a teacher does over at ICA. But that, that word literally means to make disciples. So for me personally, uh, I don't have a problem with 
connecting with people, meeting neighbors. Hannah and I have been excited lately and have talked about a strategy for connecting with neighbors, making some cookies, making our rounds, that kind of a thing. It's not too hard to connect with people in our culture, uh, but the next step is bridging the gap, turning that relationship into a gospel opportunity. It's one thing to be friendly to someone and for them to think I'm a nice person or even to know, hey, he's the guy that, that goes to church. Uh, it's another thing for me to challenge them about the need of their soul. And so I think that's one application we can take from this. Um, wherever we are, whether we're in China or in Anderson, uh, we, if we're living out the Great Commission, we're not just going and finding people and meeting people, but we're communicating the gospel to them, seeking to make disciples. Lesson two, I must go. Uh, George Stott, who he quoted here in the video back toward the beginning when he was in England, amputee and missionary with Hudson Taylor said, I do not see those with two legs going, so I must. It would have been understandable for a person with an obstacle such as Stott's to remain in England with its superior medical care, better living conditions, and greater ease. But instead, Stott followed God's call to China. Here's the question for us. What obstacle is keeping you from following God's call to your family, co-workers, neighbors, or the world? Take a few moments individually to confess your lack of faith and to chart out some initial steps of obedience, then pray together that you would each have a growing faith to follow God in obedience. And I would encourage you, even challenge you, to, to take this, this home and keep this with your Bible, or you, the spot where you do your, your daily devotions, and think through these things, pray through these things, even with your spouse or, or, or a close friend. Um, what obstacle is keeping you from following God's call to reach those around us? Uh, it's easy for us to make excuses. Oh, well, they've already heard. Or I don't want to uh, put a barrier between that loved one and myself. I don't want to turn them away. Uh, things like that. What obstacles are, are hindering us? Uh, what excuses might we have? Then there's a quote number three from Samuel Zwimmer, writing of pioneer missionaries, said that, that they had this passion to call that country their home, which was most in need of the gospel. In this passion, all other passions died. Before this vision, all other visions faded. This call drowned all other voices. So the question for us is, what passion of yours surpasses all other passions? Uh, what are you passionate about? Pastor talks about this a lot, different passions we have in life, whether it's a certain sport, whether uh, it's, you know, you fill in the blank, whatever you're passionate about. And we're all passionate about, about something, and that's not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, as we'll see even as we continue to watch this film, uh, God can and wants to use your passions for great commission work. Um, you know, you love coffee. You can use that as an opportunity for the gospel. Take a neighbor to coffee and have a co gospel conversation with them. And you love art. You love sewing, as some in our church do. Use that as a ministry. Use your talents. Use your gift for the sake of the gospel. But don't let our, our talents, our gifts, our abilities the things that we are passionate about get in the way or be an obstacle of fulfilling the Great Commission. What voice is drowning all others? I think it was Dr. Bob Jones Sr. who said, the most sobering reality in the world today is that people are dying and going to hell today. And I hope that uh, seeing this film uh, gives us a little more of a, a vision for that. Millions and billions of people uh, that are dying without Christ Lesson three, and don't worry, we're not going to go through all these tonight, but I just want to hit a few here as time allows. Lesson three, lift up the cross. Number four, modern-day China boasts an estimated population of 1.36 billion. It's over 1.4 billion now. China's largest city, Shanghai, has an estimated population of 20 million. I think the state of Indiana is around 9 million, if I'm not mistaken. So one city, 20 million. Nearly 20% of all people alive today live in China. Let that sink in. Nearly one-fifth of this planet's population live in that one nation. These are staggering numbers. Would you join Hudson Taylor to pray for willing, skillful, skillful laborers to advance the kingdom in China? Would you ask God to be merciful and save many of China's millions? Pray that Chinese believers would know sustaining grace, persevering faith, and bold love. Uh, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. That's a command uh, from the Lord Jesus himself. If we're not praying that God would send people into uh, great commission work, that he would send people to make disciples throughout the world, then, then we're not obeying uh, a command that God has given us. 
We need to be praying for, for China. We need to be praying for our own nation. Uh, we need to be praying for this world. Uh, I want to skip over to the next page, and we'll probably end with this page here. Lesson four, brave character. Uh, the part of the, the film was interesting. I don't know if you caught the significance or the, kind of the play on words uh, when they're riding on the train, and he asks his Chinese friend to write the character, which is what we think of as a symbol or a letter, um, the character for bravery. And instead, she writes about three characters, three people who exemplified bravery in their, life, in their lives. Uh, May Lee responded by writing three quotes from three gospel trailblazers, Hudson Taylor, who, whom we've heard about in this film, Jim Elliott, uh, the well-known missionary to Ecuador uh, who was killed in the 1950s by the very people he was trying to reach. You probably know the story. And William Borden, you probably heard his story as well. He was heir to the Borden Dairy Company. Uh, he, he would have inherited that company had he not decided uh, to train to go to China, a land that he never reached. He was uh, training for that mission field in the country of Egypt, I believe, when he contracted meningitis and died at, at the age of 28, 29 years old. Uh, and he's the one uh, who made the famous quote. I'll probably mess it up if I don't look at it. Uh, it's the part of the title of the film, No Regrets, No Retreats. And uh, so he, she quotes these three people, and the, the instruction here, the, the number, number six here says, take a few moments as a group to adore the original gospel trailblazer, Jesus, who emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, and endured the shame of the cross. Philippians 2 and Hebrews 12. Pray the following prayer of consecration from the Valley of Vision. This is a, a book, it's a collection, you see at the bottom, a collection of Puritan prayers and devotions. These are from hundreds of years ago. Uh, if you haven't read any of these prayers, they are quite moving. And we'll wrap up with this today. I encourage you to even read over this prayer and pray it to the Lord yourself this week. Uh, it starts there. The title of, it, of this prayer is God's Cause. Sovereign God, thy cause, not my own, engages my heart. And I appeal to thee with greatest freedom to set up thy kingdom in every place where Satan reigns. Glorify thyself and I shall rejoice, for to bring honor to thy name is my sole desire. I adore thee that thou art God, and long that others should know it, feel it, and rejoice in it. O oh, that all men might love and praise thee, that thou mightest have all glory from the intelligent world. Let sinners be brought to thee for thy dear name. To the eye of reason, everything respecting the conversion of others is as dark as midnight, but thou canst accomplish great things. The cause is thine, and it is thy glory, to thy glory that men should be saved. Lord, use me as thou wilt. Do with me what thou wilt, but oh, promote thy cause. Let thy kingdom come, let thy blessed interest be advanced in this world. Oh, do thou bring in great numbers to Jesus. Let me see that glorious day, and give me to grasp for multitudes of souls. Let me be willing to die to that end. And while I live, let me labor for thee to the utmost of my strength, spending time profitably in this work, both in health and in weakness. It is thy cause and kingdom I long for, not my own, O oh, answer thou my request. And it reminds me of the Lord Jesus' own prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And, and I'm afraid that as American Christians especially, we're often consumed uh, with our American materialism and the comfort, the creature comforts that we enjoy, that the thought of moving hundreds, even thousands of miles away for the sake of the gospel is such a foreign thought to us. The thought of, of sending our children away uh, to a place where they could be killed for the name of Jesus Christ is, is a troubling thought to us. And I'm, I'm afraid that, that we're not as passionate for the name of Jesus Christ as, as we ought to be. And so my, my desire for, for my own life and for, for us as a church is that we be so passionate about the gospel and seeing people all around the world of every tongue and tribe and nation be saved uh, that we'd be willing to do something about it. And when we, when we read in the Great Commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations, that word nations is not just talking about it's not talking about a country like the United States or China necessarily. The word nations is talking about people groups, ethnicities. That's where we get our word, ethnicities. And we read in Revelation that someday people from every tribe and tongue 
and nation will fall before the throne, singing the praises of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we willing to give up for the sake of more people coming to know the Savior that we already know? The temptation is to, to, to stay put and just kind of live our Christian life, go through the motions, and uh, to be you know, decent American citizens and forget about the world that's dying all around us. And, and we have the privilege of living in this great country. Uh, all of us in this room are more wealthy than the majority of the world out there, even just being the, the middle class uh, Hoosiers that we are. But there's a world in need of the gospel, and God calls us to go. And going might be going across the street. It might be going across, across the world. But I hope that you will take these, these notes. Uh, if you think of it and want to, um, feel free to bring them back next week, and we'll continue to look at these as we uh, finish the film. Uh, but if nothing else, I hope you will pray through uh, even just these first four lessons that we've looked at and think about uh, what we need to do today, this week, to be reaching those around us. And that might just be for you engaging in more ministries here at church or a different ministry here at church, getting involved in Awana, getting involved in uh, some other aspect of, of the ministry, using your talents and gifts for the Lord. You don't have to be a missionary to a foreign country, uh, but you have to be a missionary. You have to be a missionary if you're going to be a believer because the Lord has challenged us all to fulfill the Great Commission. So I trust that you'll pray about that this week. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving us your son to die on the cross for our sin and the sin of the whole world. Uh, we know that Christ's sacrifice was sufficient and that you plan to save people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Uh, but Lord, at least from our, our human perspective, uh, that's not going to happen unless we do our job. You choose uh, to use us as Christians, as, as your mouthpiece, and, and you've made us your hands and your feet of, of Christ's body. And you intend to use us uh, to reach this world with the gospel, Lord. So I pray that you would grip our hearts uh, with the, the true fact that the most sobering reality in the world today is that people are dying and going to hell today. And I pray that for each one of us, you would help us to take practical, practical steps uh, to reach those around us. I pray that you'd give us a burden for our neighbors. I pray that you'd give us a burden for this world, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You are dismissed.